God has shown us in his word three kinds of wisdom. And we studied the other day, wisdom is the principal thing. David said that to his son Solomon. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. He said, it will promote you. <laughs> You've seen some people who have not had any promotion for many years. What they need is wisdom. You say, well, let me explain something to you. You can be in a job or on a job and you've not been promoted at work for several years. They may have purposely chosen not to promote you. It could have even been some kind of persecution, some kind of punishment, who knows? But that has nothing to do with God's promotion. You see, the Bible says promotion doesn't come from the east or west or south. It says it comes from God. When God promotes you, it doesn't matter what men call you. It doesn't matter what label they put on you. The fact is, God's promotion brings glory, brings honor into your life. And even people who are senior to you will begin to look at you and say, Surely the Lord hath promoted thee. Hallelujah. That's the truth. That's the truth. Didn't you read it that a man was brought out of prison by the name of Joseph? And the king listened to this prisoner who was what we call a house boy. He was from there, he was put in prison. He was Potiphar's house boy. Did you get that? That's what he was. He went from there to prison because somebody told lies about him. And when he came out of prison, by invitation of the Pharaoh and spoke hmm, according to the wisdom that was granted him which gave him insight into mysteries and secrets are you there he uttered those mysteries and secrets and Pharaoh said, could there be anybody wiser than this? Could there be anybody more discreet than this? Then he said to Joseph, now you take charge of the kingdom. At your word, throughout Egypt, only at your word will anybody do this or that. He said, I'm the only one who will be higher than you. So Pharaoh became the president and Joseph became the prime minister. He became the head of government. How? By phronesis. We read it the other day. Man put him in prison. But God lifted him. Hallelujah. So we're looking at these. Um, we've gone quite far in our study. And uh, now we're talking about the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom. I am aware that there are a few translations, very few of them, that render that construction uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17 where it talks about the spirit of wisdom. 
And those few translations call it spiritual wisdom. But it's wrong. Why are they wrong? Because wisdom in itself is spiritual, whether it is positive or negative. Whether it is the wisdom of men or the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of the devil, it's something that is introduced through the spirit of man. All right? That's what the Bible talks about the spirit of the world, the worldly spirit. So, wisdom, whether positive or negative, is in itself spiritual. So, it doesn't make sense to say spiritual wisdom. Okay? Because it's, you're dealing with the spirit of wisdom. Hallelujah. But then, um, it's also important for us to understand that wisdom is not a function of the mind. Some people think that wisdom is a function of the mind. It's a big mistake. Wisdom is not a function of the mind. See, the wisdom we're dealing with here is the, what we will call the highest form of wisdom. That is the wisdom that you can live by. First of all, Sophia is not a function of the mind. Okay? It is that wisdom that is given to you in your spirit. Then we talk about the analytical wisdom. Even that is not so much a function of the mind in its perfection. But you see... You have to also understand the lower levels of wisdom. What you call brain work. Okay? It's like knowledge. You have knowledge from mental activity. You study and you gain knowledge. But then there's revelation knowledge. So we're looking at the wisdom that God puts in a man's spirit. We're looking at the condition of a man's spirit, not his reasoning ability. Because when a man's spirit is acted upon by the Holy Ghost, and the light of God dawns on it, on that spirit, then his mind, which is the doorway to his spirit, or the door of the spirit to his body or his environment will at the same time be flooded with light. Are you getting this? His mind will be flooded with light. So he becomes aware. Hallelujah. Remember when we were dealing with different kinds of knowledge and uh, the three kinds of knowledge. We talked about idol. And I said, that's when the knowledge of whatever it is has now come home. It has become part of all your knowings, which means your mind can now relate with it. When the Bible talks about renewing your mind, you renew your mind according to knowledge. First, your spirit receives revelation. And then you meditate so that you can condition your mind to accept this new truth, which he cannot explain. (laughs) Do you understand that? He cannot explain it, but he has accepted it. Now he can act on it. So, such knowledge doesn't originate from the mind. The mind is called upon to meditate and condition itself to it. So, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured by the renewing of your mind. So, it is uh, an action, the man's action on the word of God by meditation. So, he exchanges his previous Knowledge or understanding for the new thought given to him from God, 
For example, he has always thought sickness was for everybody. Everybody got sick. Everybody had malaria. If the mosquito beat you, you got malaria. So it was normal. It was for everybody. Um, if you work much under the, st- under the sun, you'd have a headache. So it's normal. Everybody gets a headache. So he thinks that way. He's been thinking that way. Then he begins to hear the word of God. And that word goes into his spirit. He opens his mind for the word of God to go into his spirit. He accepts it as reality. Because the Bible says, with the heart, man believeth. You can't believe with your mind. You believe with your heart. All right? And that's your spirit. So he believes it in his spirit. He has accepted it. But now if he's going to live by it consistently and continually, the Bible says he has to be conformed to the word. His mind will have to be renewed. So I stopped thinking of being subject to malaria. I now start thinking I'm a new creation. I've believed it. I've accepted it. Now I think that way. I condition myself to think that way. You see that? Now, my thinking that way is that synesis. Okay? I'm reasoning it. Then, what happens is, is it now conditions my spirit. What do I get? A mindset. Phronesis. Now you can't take it from me. This is now my behavior. This is my natural response to anything. Now I'm beaten by a mosquito. I do not think malaria. I just can't think that way. Why? I have had the synesis in my ability to comprehend the word of God. So I respond differently. I respond differently. I think success. I think prosperity. I think victory. I see life in one direction only. Some people say life is ups and downs. Well, I don't think so. That's your, that's your phronesis. That's your mindset. I don't have that mindset. I don't think that way. I have a different mindset. I think success only. Someone says, can somebody just only think success? Well, that's my mindset. <laughs> that's the way I think. I can't think otherwise. You see, I left that up and down life a long, long time ago. I can't think ups and downs. I don't think that way. Sometimes good and sometimes bad. Sometimes evil and sometimes good. Well, I don't think that way. That's your, that's your mentality if you think that way. That's the phronesis you have. Poor phronesis. <laughs> I think progress, success, victory, abundance. I think light. I think righteousness. I think in one direction. But you see, that's what the Bible calls the wisdom, the phronesis of the righteous. You have the wisdom of man. Now the wisdom of man is the kind that tells you ups and downs, good and evil. It's always two, good and bad. Always two. You experience this, you experience that. It's always this way and that way. But I've been called out of the world. I don't belong there. Hallelujah. Three kinds of wisdom. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Oh, glory to God. I walk in the light. Light is wisdom. I walk in the light. I've got light. I've got light. I've got light. I do not walk in confusion. Or oh, are there some things I may not know? Oh yes, maybe at the present. Maybe at the present. Maybe at the present. So if I require that knowledge, what do I do? I begin to draw from within me. First I speak in other tongues. Several times I'm going to, I'm going to speak those words concerning that thing. I'm going to speak words about it out. In other tongues, then I begin to get the interpretation. Glory to God. As I take a piece of paper and a pen, and then get ready, because you're going to speak in other tongues and bring forth mysteries. Mysteries. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. 
That wisdom is insight into mysteries. The wisdom of God, the spirit of wisdom will bring you what? Insight into mysteries. He will give you insight into mysteries and secrets. I said he's not talking about the secrets of your mother-in-law. God has shown me the secret. God has shown me the secret. What they have been doing against me, stop it. God is higher than that. He doesn't think of the realm of your enemies. Oh, my enemies. Oh, my enemies. Your enemies. <laughs> when you are small, you think about your enemies. No, imagine. How can, how can I be thinking about my enemies? Enemies. Who are they? Where are they? I can't find them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I know some people say, well... Ah, there are enemies, oh, there are enemies, there are enemies. When you're concerned about your enemies, you don't know God. You don't know God. He already told you about the devil. And what did he say about the devil? He said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He didn't say resist the devil and he'll fight you back. He said resist the devil and he will flee. He told you what will happen. He said he will flee. Satan will flee. He said, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. When you don't know that, you'll be praying about your enemies. Oh, my enemies will not see my downfall. Oh, my enemies will not my enemies. <laughs> you are a baby. <laughs> Only spiritual babies talk like that about their enemies. He said, I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Isn't that what he said? Even spiritual adolescents ought to know they have overcome the wicked one. He says, my enemy, my enemy, my enemy, you don't see my tears. My enemy, my enemy, my enemy, you see my promotion. My enemy. <laughs> you don't need that. Hello? <laughs> Say this with me. Satan is not a factor. Say it again. Satan is not a factor. Aha. Uh -huh. He's not a factor. He doesn't count. Amen. See, when you start talking about your life, Satan doesn't come in the picture. Leave him out. He's defeated. And you have your foot on his neck. Hallelujah. All right, now, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17, let's look at it again. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. All right, now, that spirit of wisdom, it says, brings you into a special kind of knowledge. In other words, he gives you insight. He says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, again, the word and before revelation doesn't have to be and. It could be for. It could be with. In the Greek. All right? They didn't have to put and there. So, you could read it this way, and it's even better. The spirit of wisdom for revelation in the knowledge of him. Because it's a special kind of knowledge. Epignosis. It's a special kind of knowledge. It's knowledge with relationship. Knowledge with participation. So when you understand what type of knowledge he's talking about, then you realize why it should be read differently. But then he says, the spirit of wisdom for revelation, the spirit of wisdom bringing you revelation, which he calls insight into mysteries and secrets. That's why the Greek word that's used there is apocalypsis. Okay? It means an unveiling, an uncovering, 
For example, if you, if you study in um, uh, Daniel chapter 10, from verse 1, can you, can you look at it for a moment? It's in Daniel chapter 10. All right. I want you to read verse 1. Have you seen verse 1? Okay, I want you to read it. (laughs) He says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revered. In the Septuagint, the Greek word there is apokalupto. Now, that means to uncover. He says, a thing was uncovered. Okay? So that's the same thing he's talking about. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. Okay? It means to unveil, to uncover. So, he uncovers mysteries. He uncovers, he unveils mysteries and secrets. That's what the spirit of wisdom will do for you. And the spirit of wisdom is one of the seven spirits of God. The spirit of wisdom is one of the seven spirits of God. And every Christian ought to have the seven spirits of God. Are you there? Now, these seven spirits of God, when you study in Isaiah chapter 11 and read verses 1 and 2, you'll understand how they have been listed there. Would you turn there? Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. Can you read it to me? One, two, go. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And, and there, just a moment, and after the word him, do you have a full stop or a comma? Good. So, the Spirit of the Lord, that's one. And then the Spirit of two. And understanding three, that's the Spirit of understanding. Good. The Spirit of counsel, four. The Spirit of might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six. The spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. These are the seven spirits of God. Hallelujah. These are the seven spirits of God. Every Christian ought to have the seven spirits of God. That's the fullness of the spirit. What do you mean by seven spirits of God they are the seven manifestations of the spirit seven distinct independent manifestations of the spirit of God like back in the old in the Old Testament God revealed himself to the children of Israel through several names He revealed himself in several names. But he was one God. Even though they knew him as Adonai. They knew God as uh, uh, Jehovah Shammah. Or they knew him, his name was El Shaddai. They knew all of those names, but they always said, The Lord our God is one God. Different names by which he revealed his character, independent character. If he dealt with you as Jehovah Rapha, it was very, very different from if he dealt with you as Jehovah Shalom. Do you understand? As though he was a different God, but he was the same God. The same God. Now we have this Holy Spirit who operates and manifests himself in seven different spirits. The Bible says there are, it says upon one stone shall be seven eyes. 
That's the prophet Zechariah speaking. When you read in his, in his prophecy, the third chapter, you read the ninth verse. He lets us understand this. Now, the book of Revelation, when you read chapter 5 and verse 6, he tells us that these eyes, these seven eyes, are the seven spirits of God. Then he says, they are sent out into all the earth. So they are working everywhere in the world today through his children. So when the Bible tells, tells us to be filled with the Spirit, he's not just talking about all the space we have. I told you the other day when we were reading in uh, Ephesians 3 chapter 19 verse, where it talked about being filled with the fullness of God. Okay? I said it wasn't just talking about loading, loading the ship to its full capacity. It was more than that. He also meant that everything that was supposed to be there, everything that was supposed to be born, was there. So not only are we being feared to ensure there is no empty space, as it were, but that everything that should fill the space is inside. Did you get that? It says to be filled with the fullness of God. The fullness, the full load of God. Everything is complete. Now he's given us the fullness of the Spirit. And the fullness of the Spirit refers to the seven spirits of God. You must have all of them in your life. Now, does that mean that when I receive the Holy Spirit, that I say, oh Lord, Holy Spirit, now that I've received you, uh, you are one, I need the other six. <laughs> no, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. Here, he's talking about the revelation of that Spirit being granted you. The manifestation, the operation of that Spirit being granted you. Why? Because he doesn't have to show up. It's between you and God. Hey, 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 what's this? this what? Come on, let me show you something. If you would read in Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. Let's read. Are you there? Verse 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Look at that. He says, I want you to take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him. Joshua had the Spirit. What Spirit is he talking about? Do you remember when God sent the 12, when Moses sent the 12 spies to go spy out the land, the land of Canaan, and uh, when they came back, 10 of them said, we can't take it. Um, we were as grasshoppers, and the people there were as giants. But there were two men who spoke differently, Joshua and Caleb. And the Bible says they had a different spirit. They had a different spirit. I like that. They had a different spirit. Now he says, a man in whom is the spirit. He said, lay your hands on him. Why did God want Moses to lay his hands on Joshua? I thought he said Joshua had the spirit. He said Joshua had the spirit. And so why does Moses have to lay his hands on him? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. I want you to read verse 9. One to go. Did you see that? 
He says, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. That's why God asked Moses to lay his hands on Joshua, even though Joshua was said to be a man who had the spirit. Now, just because he had the spirit didn't mean that he had the spirit of wisdom. Why? Because the spirit of wisdom is a different spirit. Are you still there? Now, he has not stated there what spirit exactly he was referring to. But we do know he's talking about a good spirit anyway. It still has to do with the spirit of God. All right? But... Here he says, I want you, talking to Moses, he said, I want you to lay hands on the man Joshua, in whom is the Spirit. Now, in Deuteronomy, we're told that Joshua had the Spirit, he was full of the Spirit of wisdom. And then he says, because Moses had laid his hands on him. So now we know where the Spirit of wisdom came from. Moses laid hands on him. So the man had the Spirit of wisdom. Hallelujah. Now look at that prayer that Paul is praying for the Ephesian church. He says, I pray to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, that he will give you, grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. But these Ephesian people had already received the Holy Ghost. So they were already Christians. So why is Paul praying that they be given this? Now let's suppose for a moment that we remove the word spirit from there. Okay? We will still have, I pray to God to grant you wisdom. But didn't he already say that Christ had been made unto them wisdom from God? And so why is he asking them, why is he praying for them? He's talking about the operational wisdom. So he says, the spirit of wisdom to be granted you so that you can be led into the mysteries of God. So you begin to understand the mysteries of God. There are mysteries that God's children have been given a right to know. Jesus said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. He says, but to those who are outside, meaning those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, he said, it is not given. But for you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. There are mysteries. Oh, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. For example, we lay hands on the sick and they recover. That's a mystery. That's a mystery. But it works. We talk to deaf ears. How can you talk to a deaf ear? We talk to deaf ears. We tell the deaf ear to open up and it opens up. How come? That's a mystery. How do you explain that? How can you heal a deaf ear by talking to it? No, are you there? How do you heal a deaf ear by talking to the deaf ear? Is there anybody with a deaf ear here? If you have a deaf ear, wherever you are right now, raise your hand. No, 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 let's, come on, come on, let's, let's look at something. Who's got a deaf ear? You have one deaf ear. When you listen, you listen with only one ear. Anybody? You don't want it open? Is there anybody? All right, that's one. Who else? Who else? All right. That's another. Now, who else? Anybody else? There's one there. Okay. There's one there. All right. Put your finger in the ear. Put your finger. Please be reverent. Please be reverent. It's very important to be reverent. Put your finger in the ear that is deaf. And just keep it there. Raise the other hand. 
just raise your other hand and thank Him. Because God is merciful and He will open your ear now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command the deafness to go. Ear, open up. Open up. Open up now. Be unstopped. Now, close. Close the one that was good. Open the other one. Close, close, close the one that was good before. Okay? And open the one that was bad. All right. Now, you hear me in the name of Jesus. Now, as you hear me, you that are hearing me now, come forward. You can hear me with the ear that was deaf because it's already open. It's open. You can ask someone close to you, someone close to them, talk, talk, to, the, talk to them right there where they are because they can hear me. You can hear me. You can hear me. You can hear me. You're hearing from the, from, the, from the ear that was bad before. You can come here now. Come here now. If you can hear now from that one that was, was bad. Because it's open. You can hear from both ears now. From both ears. Talk to him on both sides. So I, I said hello. He said hi from both sides. From both sides. Okay. All right. There's another. There's another guy there. Bring them closer. Bring them closer so we can we can see them. All right. What about the the next one? Yeah. You can hear now. Test him too. You have a microphone with you? Good. Hello. No, don't talk into the microphone. You talk into his ear and let him respond with a microphone. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Oh. That was the ear that was deaf. That was the ear that was bad. Oh, good. That's great. What about you? That ear was deaf. That ear was deaf. Praise God. Well, somebody say hallelujah. All right. We're talking three kinds of wisdom. Are you still there? Jesus is wonderful. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? This is no little miracle. It's a big miracle. Because nobody can do it for you. All right? So here's what I'll tell you to do. I want you to give God praise. Listen to me. Give God praise the best way you can. Thank Him and thank Him and thank Him. Are you hearing me? Thank him. Forget about everybody else here now and start thanking him. Because nobody can do this for you. Thank him with all your heart. Give him praise. testimony. God bless you. Sit down. All right, now you look here. Did it work? I told you. How can you talk to a deaf ear and then the deaf ear respond? How can you have a deaf ear 
respond. How can a deaf ear be healed by you talking to the deaf ear? I said, it's a mystery. Now, it's the same thing that happens when we find ourselves in any, any situation. The question is never, will God do something? Does he want to do something? The question is always, how much can we believe? All right, let me ask you a question. Why was I not afraid that what if it doesn't happen? How could I do it with your eyes open and you're looking at everybody? Why? Because I've come to believe the word. I've come to know the word does not fail. Many people think the word might fail. That's the reason why they, didn't, they don't put all their confidence in the word. Because they're not sure. They think it might fail. But it cannot fail. It doesn't fail. What we have to do is to learn to trust God. You learn to trust God. You learn to put your faith to work. It just cannot fail. Hallelujah. Are you still there? And that's what the spirit of wisdom will do for you. The spirit of wisdom would give you insight into mysteries and secrets. I don't want you to forget that. That's what the spirit of wisdom will do for you. The next thing it will do for you, so that's why we, we, we use that word apocalypsis, all right? For revelation. It will bring you revelation. The spirit of wisdom will bring you revelation. Okay? Then in verse 18, he says, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Have you noticed that? Okay. Being enlightened. The Greek word is fortizo. Meaning, having light thrown on something. It's an illumination. Now, look at the difference between the two. The first one is something that's covered. And then we open it. He says the Spirit of God will open it for us to see what's inside. He'll unveil the mystery. So, wow! Now I can see it. Apocalypsis. You see it? It's a revelation. It's been unveiled. Oh, the Holy Spirit in His manifestation in my life of the Spirit of Wisdom will do this for me. He will unveil secrets, unveil mysteries to me. Now I can know what's there. It's been uncovered. I read it to you. It says, a thing was uncovered to Daniel. Hallelujah. Actually, the word, the Greek version doesn't say a thing was uncovered to Daniel. He says, the word. He tells us it was the word. He says, the word. Another version says, a word was uncovered, revealed to Daniel. But King James translation there from the Hebrew text says, a thing was revealed to Daniel. All right, so that's apocalypsis, okay? Now, the second one, that's in verse 17. In verse 18, where it says, the eyes of your understanding. Now, this is something that many of God's children need. And that's the reason he was praying for them. It says, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, being flooded with light. Now, that means there is a darkness in my understanding. You get it? There is a darkness about my understanding. There are things that I don't know. In the first one, 
something is unveiled. Mysteries are unveiled. The cover is taken off so I can see it. In this second one, it is, it is covered with darkness. Not a veil, not a cover really. It, it is shielded away from me, hidden from me because of the darkness. I cannot see it because of the darkness. So he says, turn the light on it. You see that? So the light is put on it and I can see it. Oh, why? There was darkness so I didn't see what was there. Now the light is thrown on it, the rays come on it and now I can see. Oh, look at it because of the light. So the Greek word is fortizo. The eyes of your understanding being flooded with light. He says, let the light be turned on in your understanding. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Do you know what that makes us? Do you know what that turns us into? When your understanding, the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your spirit become flooded with light. It's like Solomon. The Bible says nothing was hid from the king that he could not explain to the queen of Sheba. She came with hard questions to test him. That's what the Bible says. He says, but nothing was hid from the king. That means his mind, his understanding had been flooded with light. There was no area of darkness that the king could not understand. Nothing was hidden from him. No darkness. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mysteries are unveiled to us. Dark areas are illuminated. Think about it. What a life. And this is what he prayed for. This is what the Spirit prayed for. Prayed for the church that we should have. So that when you're on your own and you're meditating, hey, everything is unveiled to you. Everything is clear to you. No darkness. No wonder the Bible says in him there is no darkness at all. In him, no darkness at all. But in many people, so much darkness. There's darkness about their business. There's darkness about their finances. There's darkness about their, their family. There's darkness. So many things they don't understand. They walk in darkness. Darkness about the, the contract they just got. They didn't know how to execute it right. They got into trouble. Darkness. Darkness. But he says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding, being flooded with light, that you may know, become aware of the hope of his calling. Not only that, he tells us because of this, we can become aware of the awesome power. Ah, let me, let's read it. Visions chapter 1. I'm reading it to you from, from the Amplified. I want you to listen. 17. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, of insight into mysteries and secrets, in a deep and intimate knowledge of him, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light, so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you, and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, he set apart ones. And so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness. Hey, uh, look, at, look, look, he says immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Higher. He wants us to know that power. He wants it to become our experience in life. The resurrection power. Immeasurable. Unlimited. 
Think about it. Surpassing power. And he wants us to walk in the light of that power. He says that power was demonstrated at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet it has been given to us to live by. But he says only when our eyes, the eyes of our spirit, become flooded with light can we understand this. Otherwise we'll be walking as defeated people. The rich begging for bread. Think about it. How many of you today might be begging for money to transport yourself home? Think about it. Who knows? How many are going to be begging for money to execute a contract? Who knows? How many will be begging for this and begging for that? The rich begging. But they do not know they are rich. He said they know not, neither will they understand. He said they walk on in darkness. He said, I have said, ye are gods, and all of your children of the Most High. He said, but you shall die like men. Why? Because they know not. That's why children of God die of cancer, die of all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of ailments. Seek and die. And even as I speak now, there are those who are afflicted. Afflicted. They're suffering so much pain. The pain is so much they can't even pray anymore. But what does the Bible say? So I pray that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your spirit, will be flooded with light. As I'm speaking now, light is coming into your spirit. Oh, yes. Because you're being enlightened by the Word of God. That's how that happens. You start understanding things that the ordinary mind cannot understand. There are people who hear this kind of things and they argue. But you hear and you believe. You hear and you believe. That's the reason such such miracles you just saw now could happen right before your eyes. That's the way it happened in Jesus' day. Nothing was impossible. Everything was under the power, under the dominion of the Son of God. And then he said... I have overcome the world. He said, go ye therefore and make students of the nations. He said, as my father has sent me, even so send I you. So you take that authority and you go to the office. You take that authority and you hit the streets. You're out on the job. You're out on business. But you know who you are. The wisdom of God is working in me. Illuminating my mind. Unveiling mysteries to me. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nebuchadnezzar said, I had a dream. If I don't get the interpretation, I'm going to kill everybody. And all the wise men were going from place to place. They told him, they said, all right, now, O king, please, before you harm anybody, tell us your dream, and we will give you the interpretation. King Nebuchadnezzar said, you think I'm a fool? If I tell you the dream, you will lie. You will give me false interpretation. He said, before I know that you are so wise, he said, tell me my dream. He said, if you can tell me what I dreamt, then you will be right with the interpretation. The wise man said, ah, nothing like that in this world has ever happened before. How can somebody tell you your dream? said to the king's servant please tell the king to give us a few more days he said there is a God in heaven who reveres secrets 
He gives apocalypses. Do you understand? He gives revelation. Say there is a God in heaven. Please tell the king to hold on. He said, I will pray together with my folks, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, we will fast and pray. And they fasted and prayed. And God gave to Daniel the king's dream and the interpretation. And then he came before the king. All the king's wise men were sitting. And Daniel told the king his dream. The king said, excellent. That's exactly what I dreamt. (laughs) And he gave the king the interpretation. And what did they say about Daniel? They said he had an excellent spirit. The spirit of wisdom is that excellent spirit. Look at it. He says he will give you insight into mysteries and secrets. The Bible says the secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. So we're playing with them. But there are secret things that belong to God. And the only way you can know those things, the Bible says, who knows the mind of the Lord except the Spirit of God? So nobody knows the mind of God. Nobody knows the things of God except the Spirit that is of God. But that Spirit has come to dwell in us. Hallelujah. No wonder Jesus said he shall take off mine and shall show it unto you. He will guide you into all reality, into all truths. Somebody said, I've received the Holy Spirit. So why have I not been guided into all truth? Because that is the spirit of wisdom. You haven't functioned with him yet. And that's why I'm introducing him to you. You can talk in tongues and never know the spirit of wisdom. There are many Christians who don't know the spirit of faith. But the spirit of faith functions with the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of understanding functions with the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of counsel functions with the spirit of wisdom. Many only know the spirit of might. Look at Samson. He lacked the spirit of wisdom. But he had the spirit of might. He lacked the spirit of counsel, but he had the spirit of might. Suddenly, the spirit of God came mightily upon Samson, and he took a jawbone of an ass and destroyed 1,000 men of war. The miraculous took place, but Samson was broke. No wisdom. That's why there are many Christians, and including ministers, who have the miraculous. The great power of God is shown in their lives. They lack phronesis. So they wonder, what is the problem? I've been a Christian many, many years. Why isn't this working out? They know everything, and yet they have nothing. They know everything, and yet things are not working out right. Why? They, have, they haven't f- had fellowship with the spirit of wisdom. This spirit of wisdom will give you insight into mysteries. Those questions you are still asking, he will answer them. He will make sure your understanding gets flooded with light. He will explain to you. Didn't you read it? He said, I am understanding. He said, counsel is mine. Which means you will never know the spirit of understanding, nor know the spirit of counsel, until you know the spirit of wisdom. He says, I go with both of them. So every time the spirit of wisdom shows up, he doesn't come alone. You have many Christians, they're talking in tongues, but they lack wisdom. Is the spirit of wisdom that gives you that phronesis. See, without that, there's no movement. Your life will be in the same place. Ten years, you'll be the same. When you speak, people are angry. When you utter words, it's like the word of foolishness. 
Now, what is she saying? What is he saying? People are upset because there's something about you. Meanwhile, you're speaking in tongues. You have the Holy Spirit. There are other manifestations of the Holy Spirit in your life. Beautiful manifestations. Oh, when you worship, it's like wonderful. You know? You sing, it's like heaven has come down. But for nurses, mm mm. Why? Because you have ignored the spirit of wisdom. And he says, they that ignore me, he said, they shall smart for it. They shall suffer for it. Hallelujah. Oh, how you need the spirit of wisdom. This is the way, see, the, the way Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. That's the way you ought to pray for your kids. I pray God to grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Because if you know God, you know everything, brother. That's the way you pray. That's the way you pray. If you recognize him, he says he'll promote you. Come on, let's, let's go there. Proverbs chapter 4. Have you seen it? Verse 8. Let's read from verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor. And when thou dost embrace her, she shall give to thy head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. You won't struggle for it. He will deliver it to you. Hallelujah. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Are you going to give wisdom place in your life? Lastly. So, I've told you, he brings you what? Apocalypsis. And he brings you what? Fertizo. Okay. The last one. This is nice. He brings you, I already just mentioned it really. He brings you counsel. Counsel. Counsel and direction. The spirit of wisdom will bring you counsel and direction. Have you ever seen people who just, they cry and cry. What they need in their life is direction. They look like they are on a journey to nowhere. You know, they know that they have no direction in their lives. They are working, yes. They are living, yes. Everything is going, but somehow there's no direction. They don't know what to do next. That's why you need the spirit of wisdom. You bring you counsel. Acts chapter 16. Are you there? Who's found it? Thank you. Let me read it to you here. Acts chapter 16. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Can you imagine that? The Bible says the Holy Spirit stopped them from preaching the word in Asia. There's what you call specific direction. You know, a lot of times we find ourselves just living generally. We live on the general knowledge of God's word. But there is specific guidance for each one of us. You know, some people say, well, um, now that I am X, Y, Z, I ought to get this job now. This is the next thing I want to do. Okay, I want to take this exam. Uh, uh, I want to get married. Um, you know, things they feel it's time to do because the normal life around them says that is it. Why don't people ask themselves a question? Not a simple question is, why do so many people suffer? I don't know if you listen to the news sometimes. There's no day that passes by without several people dying. Every day. At least, if it doesn't happen anywhere else, it will happen in Iraq. <laughs> no, you know what I'm talking about. So why do so many people suffer in life? They don't act with wisdom. The Bible says, Paul and his folks here, 
they were traveling together, in that they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Sometimes you find you want, you, you want to talk to somebody and the Spirit of God stops you. Have you ever had that counsel from within? The Holy Spirit brings you counsel from within. That's what we're talking about, advice. And usually it's a strong voice when he talks to you. Come on, look at the next verse. After they were come to Messiah, they are said to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Spirit permitted them not. This is wisdom. The Bible says the Spirit didn't allow them. Has there been anything in your life that the Spirit didn't allow you and you knew it was the Spirit? You know, most of the time we find ourselves knowing only after the experience that it was God. Why can't we know ahead? We ought to. That's the way these folks lived. They wanted to go and preach the word in Asia. The Holy Ghost said no, so they stopped. They said, all right, we'll go to Bithynia. The Spirit didn't permit them, so they stopped. So now they're waiting for guidance. No, the guy carries his things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to UK. I must go. So he packs his things, and he goes. Then he gets to the UK to be living a life from hand to mouth. No house, nothing. Moving in the streets for nothing. Lack of phronesis. I'm going to America. Somebody said, well, I got this, what they call it, green, green something? Something for green card, huh? Visa lottery. Yeah. He says, I won the visa lottery. If it's not the will of God, how can he give it to me? Hey, ah! Uh, look at you. That you got the visa lottery is no proof at all that God has anything to do with it. Did God apply? You see, I, I, I got the visa, so I have to travel now. After all, it's God that gave it to me. He got, he got him bring it. He got him bring it. He got him bring it. How will I get it? He got him bring it. There are many people that are asking for it. I'm one of the few people that got it. So now, you believe that because you got the visa lottery, God is in it. <laughs> I laugh at you. It's no proof at all! I know, somebody is thinking of what to do with his visa now. <laughs> the visa lottery that you collected by yourself. Go! Remember Lot. Jesus said in his teaching, when he was uh, giving them uh, some eschatology, he said, remember Lot's wife. That's where he stopped. It's a verse of scripture. So I'm saying to the such fellows, remember Lot. Where did he end up? In a hole. He ended in a cave. He was too ashamed to go back to Zohar. He was too ashamed to go into the city and ask for anything. The time comes in your life when you have so walked outside of the will of God and you end up in a cave like Lot. You wouldn't even have the boldness to call those that know you to say, please help me. You rot in there and die there. Or die and rot in there. Is it? Which comes first? <laughs> You see, serious trouble, brother. Isaac, everybody was packing out of Gera. Isaac also started getting his things. The economy of this nation has turned upside down. While he was packing his things, God stepped in. Oh. Oh. Hey. Oh. Why? Because God remembered Abraham. So he stepped in. He said, Isaac. I know everybody's getting out of town. He said, don't go. Stay here. Sande He said, stay here. He said, I'll give all these countries into your hands. 
Isaac took his things back. The servants came and said, aren't we moving, sir? He said, relax. God just spoke to me to remain. Remain here? I said, yeah. Then God began to bless him. The Bible says the man grew and waxed great and became very great. The Bible says he went forward. I like that. I like that. Until the Philistines envied him. He became so great. He could have acted like Lot. Lack of phronesis. Every morning you are at the embassy. <laughs> Don't worry. Ticket to trouble. Okay? Did God say go? Hey, must God say? Must God say something? So, can't somebody go to where he wants to go again? <laughs> Can somebody go to where he wants to go? They'll be asking somebody, did God say, did God say? Ha huh? <laughs> Okay. After some years, you will understand. No problem. You just got a job. You are moving. Can't you ask yourself, is this of the Spirit? Once they have offered you higher amount of money, higher pay, right away, you just, I'm resigning from this one. You are accepting that other one. Continue. That's not the way of the spirit. A spiritual man thinks differently. A spiritual man thinks differently. Thanks be unto God, we have the spirit of wisdom to show us, give us insight into the mysteries surrounding this uh, uh, the, what do you call it? This job that you have just gotten. This appointment, this new appointment. I got admission into uh, American University. Now you're looking for money everywhere. You must pay this $30,000 so that you can travel. Continue. You will borrow on everybody's neck until. <laughs> just go on. Go on. You just collect. You you just got admission into university of somewhere in in the UK. Okay. Okay. After three years, we will know whether you are still in that university. <laughs> what am I saying? That everything in your life requires the guidance of the Spirit. Everything in your life requires the guidance of the Spirit. So you hear it once. I said, be synchronized with the Spirit of God. Be in His timing. And it's easy. It's very easy. I thought on that in the, in the second service. You synchronize yourself with the Spirit of God. Make sure you get the tapes. Hallelujah. So here he shows us how that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God didn't permit them to preach the word in Asia or to go into Bithynia. Hallelujah. All right, when you study in Acts, the 13th chapter, you read from the first verse down to the fifth verse, you find how that some of these uh, prophets and teachers, Paul the apostle being one of them, and uh, he was there with Barnabas. And the Bible tells us, while they were praying and fasting, they were there together, praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. Somebody said, God said, separate Paul and Barnabas. I said, he didn't say that. He said, separate Paul and Barnabas. I said, didn't say that. He said, separate Paul and Barnabas unto me, not separate Paul and Barnabas. The two of them were to be separated from the others for a certain work of the ministry. He didn't say separate the two of them. Hallelujah. Okay, so that's what the Spirit of God said. He spoke. If you read in Acts the 11th chapter, I believe the 12th verse, Peter said, the Spirit bade me go. He said, the Spirit... Ask me to go. They had this confidence in the Holy Spirit. 
They have this confidence, absolute confidence. What about Philip? The Spirit of God spoke to him and said, there was a chariot. He said, join thyself to that chariot. Do you know which bus to enter? They said the Christian brother, he just, he was going to work, came out, entered one bus, and the bus was full of thieves. Then they started beating him, beating him, beating him, collected all these things and kicked him out of, where, 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 where was your phronesis? Suffering for nothing. How did you enter the bus? You just went headlong. The first bus you saw, it was going to my 12, and you entered. Is he my 12 or two? I don't know which one. He just entered and they carried him. Then they started pounding him. Now you say, Ura Baba, Ura Baba, Ura Baba, Ura Baba. If you had done Ura Baba before you entered the bus. Yeah. If you had done that before entering the bus, why you're going Ura Baba, Shandalaba? You want to enter Haya. shall hear a voice behind you saying stop this is the way walk in hallelujah glory amen refuse to get into that situation in your life I said wisdom is a force that's phronesis Hallelujah. You still there? Yeah. All right, you know we're rounding this thing off now. Counsel from within. Counsel, counsel, counsel. Peter said, the Spirit bade me go. The Spirit bade me go. Can we be that acquainted with the Spirit? Now, the spirit of wisdom does something also, which is so beautiful. He can take over our faculties. God, oh, this is a beautiful part of it. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Hmm. He can take over our faculties. And make statements of wisdom. Guide us through revelation. Now, let me, let me explain this to you because it's so, so important. If you read in, in the book of Ezekiel, a few, several places, you find Ezekiel says he was praying. All right? And it says, the spirit entered into me. And set me on my feet. He didn't say the Spirit talked to me and asked me to stand up. The Spirit, he knew it was the Spirit of God that was moving him. Can we know it's the Spirit? Can we be so yielded to the Holy Spirit that we know that as we are walking down some way, we are walking by the Spirit? Do we know when we're in the Spirit? John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard him say it unto me. He heard the voice of God. He was in the Spirit. You can be in the Spirit. And this is one of those things that the Spirit of wisdom can do for us. It can take over our faculties and minister to us and through us that way. And these are not things that are expected to happen just by chance. No. The things that the Spirit of God wants us to, for example, when I was teaching and I got to a point where I talked about the ears and the word, okay, suddenly I became aware that the Spirit of God had started talking, okay, and that He was in charge of whatever I was doing now. You get it? So I knew, even though I said, okay, is there anybody who's deaf in one ear? Now, that was no longer 
me just wanting to do something. It was the Spirit. I was being prompted by the Spirit. And I was conscious. I knew that I was being prompted by the Spirit. But I didn't tell you that. Okay? I didn't tell you that. Now, before I began to minister to them, I felt the power of God like I would feel it many times. I felt it. I felt it strong in my right hand. You say, what, what does it feel like? Well, I can't tell you that today. But I felt it. Okay? So I knew the anointing to heal was also present. Can you see that? Even though I didn't tell you. But I knew. And so I went ahead. Now somebody can do the same thing and get no result. Why? Because he was doing what he thought to do, different from what the Spirit of God was leading, guiding. Now when I preach or teach, I give my faculties to the Spirit. So apart from sharing with you, being inspired, many times I will speak as the Spirit gives utterance. You see that? And then while I'm looking at you, I'm looking in the Spirit. So I'm aware of myself here, but I'm aware in the Spirit. Now this is what, this is what the Word of God is teaching us that we can function by the spirit of wisdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I said, thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Ho, 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 ho. Hallelujah. Londa griha satrahashta. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. It's important that I'm going to pray for you in a moment, okay? I think I should pray for you. Amen. Yes, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Thank you, Lord. May God's wisdom function in your life. pray for you that from today you will experience a greater move of the spirit in your life like never before the guidance of the spirit of God the manifestation of the spirit of wisdom in your daily life in your job in your business in your family in your personal work with God everywhere you go oh that the wisdom of God will be manifested in your life thank you Holy Spirit thank you Holy Spirit Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This week... began looking at 
the scriptures to acquaint ourselves with God's word, with the necessary information on wisdom. We looked at several New Testament scriptures and uh, Old Testament scriptures as well. And we found a lot of enlightening things. And we, we said that the three kinds of wisdom mentioned in the New Testament for us to observe are Sophia, Synesis, and Phronesis. And we defined each one of them. Sophia, we said, was insight into reality. In all learning, science, into hidden things, we refer to enigmatic and symbolic languages. Sunes, as we said, was comprehension, perception, understanding. And we refer to the, the ability to understand concepts. We also talked about it as quickness of apprehension. In particularly what we call the penetrating consideration which precedes action. We saw Sophia as theoretical wisdom and Sunesis as critical wisdom. And then we looked at the third one, Phronesis. And we define that as a mindset, meaning to have a mindset, good judgment, the ability to govern one's life wisely. Also in dealing with resources. And then we decided to look more carefully at that very first area of its definition with regards to the mindset. And we also define the mindset as a fixed mental attitude or disposition that predetermines a person's responses to situations and his interpretation of those situations. We looked at the importance of having the right mindset. If you have the wrong mindset in life, you are sunk. The reason a lot of people live the kind of life they live today is the mindset they have. Whether you believe in failure or success is according to your mindset. And your mindset has been created over a period of time. And that is phronesis. When a man acts foolishly, you know, the Greek would say aphrone, meaning that uh, <laughs> he lacks phronesis. Phronesis is practical wisdom. And we, we studied that. We looked at the life of Solomon, King Solomon. Remember that uh, you can't talk about wisdom without thinking of the man Solomon. 
the man whom God gave so much wisdom. And we, we studied it and found out that what God gave to Solomon above everybody else was phronesis. He had in abundance practical wisdom. And then we also looked at the different forms of Sophia. When we studied the Sophia of this world, wisdom of this world, the Sophia of men, the Sophia of God. You remember that? I'm just trying to quickly go through some of those things with you. And you know, when we were talking about Sinesis, we said one of the key thoughts in it is the, uh, the literal definition of Sinesis being um, putting together mentally. And there's a reason why we were looking at that. Because that helped us to, to see the importance of that kind of wisdom. And I said, you, you need that for your business. You need that for your, your job, your school, your family. You need that. The ability to analyze, comprehend, perceive. Well, we call it sagacity. And um, if you followed that teaching properly, you'd recall we saw how that Solomon had an abundance of it. We remember the extraordinary amplitude of his comprehension, broad mindedness. And we found out in the Bible how that the Queen of Sheba paid him a visit and asked him hard questions. And the Bible says Solomon told her all the answers, and there was nothing hid from Solomon. Praise God. Oh, I like that. He knew everything. Boy, his mental capacity was extraordinary. Extraordinary. And the Bible says it was a gift from God. It was a gift from God. You know, the scriptures tell us if, if anybody lacks wisdom, he says, let him ask of God. And yet Christ has been made unto us wisdom from God. Amen. Yeah. So we looked at all of that. We talked about Phronesis being what? Intelligence. And Phronesis being prudence. And uh, that's where I want to take off today. What Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 8. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Success of failure is the payment hmm, on the operation of phronesis in your life. How much of God's wisdom is operational in you? And you remember we talked about Joseph who had an excellent spirit. And the Bible tells us that he, he had phronesis, and we discovered that. And he also had what? Synesis. He was discreet. Do you remember all of that? Or did you leave your notes here and, and go home? We talked about the phronesis of Paul, a synesis of Paul. When we looked at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, when ye read that ye may understand my synesis in the mystery of Christ. Do you remember that thought? 
All right. Now, on Sunday, we were looking at what wisdom, the spirit of wisdom. We talked about the spirit of wisdom Sunday and what the spirit of wisdom does for us. We said, number one, it brings us what? Apocalypsis, revelation. Number two, we said fortizo. What is that? Illumination. Okay? Throwing rays on the object. And then thirdly, we said counsel. Right? We get counsel. We get direction. All right? The spirit of wisdom does this for us. We also talked about how that the spirit of wisdom is one of the seven spirits of God. Hallelujah. And how that we can actually yield our mental faculties to the spirit of wisdom. So we can be guided, we can be led by the spirit of wisdom. When the spirit of wisdom dominates your life, things change. You see, let me explain this. It's one thing to have faith, but there is something called the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith, when you have the spirit of faith, it controls your speech, controls your actions. That's different from the guy who says, um, I'm trying to work on it by faith. He doesn't try. He doesn't try to work on it by faith. Things are different. Paul said, as it is written. I believed, therefore have I spoken. Is that we also having the same spirit of faith. The spirit of faith says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. He speaks according to his believing. He believes. You know, our, our everyday communication betrays our lack of faith. For example, somebody says, you won't believe what has happened. And the thing that has happened is a good one. So you won't believe what has happened. Why won't he believe what has happened? Say, hey, I'm a believer. Tell me. Go ahead. Try me. <laughs> try me. I believe. The man with the spirit of faith speaks according to his believing. He believes. And so he speaks. Hallelujah. So... It's important for us to have the spirit of wisdom. So I try to explain to you the spirit of faith. You know, the spirit of faith causes you to say things and do things in an extraordinary manner. I remember some, several years ago, 1986. Now, of course, I've had so many of that happen, but I want to give you an old one. So um, I was in a certain meeting preaching. I hadn't preached up to... 10 minutes and I walked up to someone who was on crutches on the front row and it was a lady and I commanded her to walk in the name of Jesus and she was healed instantly now after that happened and everybody was rejoicing I started asking myself how, why did you do that? For just 10 minutes into my preaching, probably less. And I walked straight to her. I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't reasoning. I wasn't thinking through it. That happens by the spirit of faith. You understand? There's a difference between acting your faith and when the spirit of faith takes over 
Same thing, I'm saying that to explain something about the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom puts the word of God consciously in your spirit and in your mouth. And you are so full of that word. You see, we need to understand that the word of God is the wisdom of God. When the scriptures speak to you, it's wisdom speaking to you. The word of God is the voice of wisdom. Somebody said, I really want to have wisdom. Get in the word. You see, that thing you're holding in your hand, that Bible, is a compilation of the message or messages from wisdom. Wisdom is the one talking to you when you're listening to the word of God. For example, when the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That is wisdom telling you something about being in Christ. Wisdom is talking. That's wisdom. That's the voice of wisdom. He's telling you, he's giving you his insights into the new creation. He's giving you his insight into reality. When you read, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, that's not just a statement from John. That's wisdom talking to you. Wisdom is telling you. You see, he is wisdom. He has insights. He said, counsel is mine. He said, I am understanding. He said, I dwell with prudence. And you know, prudence in the Old Testament um, refers to shrewdness. You know what shrewdness is? Shrewdness. He says, I dwell with prudence. So he might as well say, I dwell with shrewdness. Highly, mentally skilled, acute. He's sensitive, he's smart, he's fast. He's got quickness of imagination. He acts swiftly. And wisdom gives that to you. So wisdom tells you the one inside you is greater than the one outside. And when he tells you, he's counseling you, he's telling you, he's advising you, he's instructing you. You see that? He's enlightening you. And what should that do for you? It should make you bold. It should make you strong. It should make you fearless. So when something happens and wisdom wells that thing up in you, greater is he that is in you. Then you stand strong. You stand your ground. Hallelujah. Wisdom. 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 Tell us about wisdom. Say it again. Wisdom. 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 So the word of God is the wisdom of God. So when you're studying the scriptures, understand that wisdom is talking to you. Oh, it pays. It pays to follow the word. Because following the word is listening to wisdom. And following wisdom and acting wisely. Praise God. Ha, ha, ha. No wonder, no wonder Paul said, we speak wisdom among them that are mature. He says, not the wisdom of this world. Not the wisdom of this world. 
The wisdom of this world understands diabetes. The wisdom of this world understands stomach pain, chest pain, headaches, colds, fevers, etc., etc. That's the wisdom of this world. He said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. He said, even, oh, I love it. He said, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He set it aside for us. He says, even the hidden wisdom. Why are many Christians not operating in that hidden wisdom which was reserved for their promotion, reserved for their greatness? God is saying this hidden wisdom reserved only for us. The rest of the world have no access to this Sophia from God. We are the only ones that have access to it. Why are so many Christians functioning without it? Oh, think about it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because most of them have never been taught. That's the reality. Most of them have never been taught. Most have never been taught. Look at how many of you are in church tonight. So many of you. Go to many churches on Wednesday. Very few people. Because they don't learn anything. So why do you go to church? Now you know, when you know that in the house of God, you can learn something to live by. Oh, you'd be there. The Bible says the fool ignores knowledge. He ignores it. He ignores information. And yet he wants to see, he wants to be successful. He wants to be great. He wants to do something right. So, um, oh God, please, oh God. Then God says, hey, the wisdom you need is in that book. But he doesn't want to read it. He holds the Bible like this and he says the Bible is too complicated. He drops it. But that is where wisdom is. And so in the house of God, the word is ministered to your spirit. You see, you're here tonight. By the time you leave here, you will live better than how you were when you came. You see, that's, that's the secret of God's word that many people don't understand. You can't live here the same way. The word is being ministered right now to your spirit. You would have to live here better than whatever you were when you came. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Yes, that's the way it is. So the word of God is the wisdom of God. And you remember, Jesus Christ is the living word. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. All right? Jesus is the living word. And that's in John's gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14. It says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know the word of God is what became Jesus. Praise God. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24, it tells us that Jesus Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And I love the way he puts it. It says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. That's absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Christ is the wisdom of God. He's the wisdom of God. So that lets us know who wisdom really is. When you read in Proverbs the 8th chapter, you find him speaking in the first person. All right? Where he says, I wisdom. You know? He speaks in the first person and, and, and lets us know what he would do for anybody. Of course, a lot of times you find the feminine pronoun used. 
But wisdom is the Word of God. Wisdom is Christ. That's wisdom. Now, let's, let's, let's look at the way wisdom talks to us. There's some very powerful things in the Word of God, and, and except you observe them, to use them, Okay, can we examine 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Let's look at it for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Have you seen it? All right, I want to read verse 6. Verse 6. How be it we speak? Wisdom among them that are perfect. He says, we speak, okay? Speak. With what do you speak? Hello? Hey, I told you, you see, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom made us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Wisdom made us. And he gave us a mouth. How many of you have a mouth? You got a mouth? Are you sure? What do you use your mouth for? For many people, for eating and just telephone. <laughs> They're always on the phone. Eating, drinking, and making noise. Things that are speaking, let me leave that. All right. So, he says, we speak wisdom. And I said, we speak with the mouth. Now, in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the Bible says, can we read it? That if thou, can you read it? Come on now. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. You ought to know that all by, by heart, off by heart now. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Memory verse. Now he says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, letting us, oh boy, it's so important. Can you imagine how important that is? That he said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Now, wisdom is telling us how to be saved. <laughs> you know, some people call sinners to the front and they, well, all the sinners are there, say, oh, pray, pray after me. And all the sinners are <clears throat> in front of the platform. They say, oh, God, save me. And they say, oh, save me, Jesus, save me now. Oh, save me. Oh, save me. Oh, save me. Then he says, Jesus is hearing you now. Pray, pray, pray. Oh, save Oh, Jesus, you'd never be saved that way. They may cry there and make you happy. But I tell you, when they leave, salvation has not been experienced. Salvation is not at work. They're still going to do the same thing next week if you gave the same call. Oh, save me, Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry for my sin. Two times sorry. You know. He will not respond. Why? Because you are not operating according to the word. He said in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, it's written there how to be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Confess is the word, Greek word homologia, meaning speaking the same thing in consent. That means saying the same thing in agreement. Okay? So if you will say the same thing in agreement with God, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, and I think you should mark the word mouth, I'll come to that. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, he says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believing in your heart. 
that God had raised him from the dead. He says, thou shalt be saved. Did he say, thou shalt pray there? No. If thou shalt cry? No. If thou shalt beg? No. If thou shalt repent? No. You cannot repent. And you know that, that, that some people say, <laughs> repent means to turn about and turn away to do the right thing. But you cannot do the right thing until you have a new life. You see, many people don't understand the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Understanding the subject of repentance with respect to the gospel. There was a message preached to Israel and the message preached to the Gentiles. The two different messages. The message to Israel was to repent. The message to the Gentiles was not to repent. In fact, the only idea of repentance that they were told was to repent from these dumb idols. Okay? But idolatry is not the only thing that keeps someone away from God. Are you listening? And these messages were preached at a time that the revelation of the gospel was still very uh, little. They had very little light until the Pauline revelation was formed and understood that eternal life was what Jesus brought to everybody. Hallelujah. So when you receive Christ, you have a new life. He brought something more than forgiveness, something more than repentance. He brought a new life. So he says, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, there is no past. He ceases to be what he used to be. He doesn't need to change his way. Why? Because when he receives life, it's a new life. It has been changed already. He doesn't need to change. What he has to do now is to live according to the light of the new life that he has. You get it? But until you study the scriptures, you can't understand this. Look at it. Romans 10, 9. Salvation, as easy as that is. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus, believing in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now the tenth verse says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Meaning you can't believe with your mind. You see, you can't believe with your brain. You believe with your heart, your spirit. So he says, with the heart man believe it. God has told us. Wisdom has said, it's with your heart that you believe. Oh, I like that. So, you know, as long as you are reasoning it, is it true? Is it not true? You cannot believe. Why? It is not for the reasoning. It's not for the mind. It's for the heart, the human spirit. And God has said every human person, being a spirit being, has the ability to believe God. He says, with the heart man believe it unto righteousness. And with the mouth, he says, confession is made unto salvation. In other words, with the mouth, you catapult yourself unto salvation through confession. How important the mouth is. The Greek word for mouth is stoma. All right? Now, why did I tell you that? It means something. It means the front or edge of a weapon. So the words that God has chosen, he carefully chose them. He's letting us know what these things are. Your mouth is given to you to charge your cause and to do battle. Let me give you another idea. Listen to this. In the Old Testament, God said to the children of Israel, when he spoke to Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, you read from verse 1 all the way to verse, to verse uh, 8, you find a remarkable statement from God. In fact, you include verse 9. Now, here's what he says. He says, every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. So they knew all they had to do was step on that land. If they stepped there, it belonged to them. He said, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, 
that have I given unto you. If these Israelites got to any nation and trod there, it belonged to them. You couldn't take it from them. You couldn't defeat them. <laughs> In the New Testament, there's a difference. The power is not in your feet. Look at this. You know, uh, there's some, some Christians, you know, they want a building. They say, we want to take this building for our church. And then they start marching around. We are soldiers, soldiers of the cross. In the name of Jesus, we have conquered. Hey, we are soldiers. Are you listening? Listen. Listen. The victory is no longer here. Why? Listen. It's, see, it's important. Because we are born of the Spirit. We have come alive in the Spirit. In the Old Testament, they were spiritually dead because they were cut away from God. Spiritual dead is separation from God. But now we are spiritually alive. So we do battle in the realm of the spirit. And in the realm of the spirit, there's no recognition of distance. You don't need to march around there. The power is in where? Stoma. The Greek says stoma. It's the front or the edge of a weapon. Hey. Which means every time you release something from your stoma. That's the weapon. The weapon is in your mouth. It's in your mouth. No wonder in the 17th verse of the 6th chapter of the book of Ephesians, he says, take unto you the sword of the Spirit, which is, he says, the rhema of God. He didn't say, the, which is the logos, all right? Not the lalia, but what? The rhema. Rhema is the spoken words. The sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. Which means the sword of the Spirit is in your mouth. The sword is in your mouth. You know, you, you got some people, they're praying and say, In the name of Jesus, I take the sword of the Spirit. I give you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You've lost already. The sword is not in your head. The sword is in your mouth. Glory to God. Hold on. Have you seen where they try to act out these things? And so they say the Roman soldier, you know, and they say the helmet of salvation, put something there. The breastplate of righteousness, put something here. But now they take the shield of faith and so they hold a shield. And then the sword of the spirit, and then they hold this and say, sword of the spirit, it's in their hand. No, it's wrong. It's in the mouth. All right, let me show you something from the Bible. You ready to see this? Yes. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 16. Are you there? Revelation chapter 1, book of Revelation, chapter 1, and verse 16. Are you ready to read it? Yes. All right, let's go. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Look, his hands were there. He had something in his right hand, but it was not the sword. Where was the sword? Okay, go to chapter 2. The same book, chapter 2. Read verse 16. Just a moment. Just a moment. Let me give it to you. Have you found it? Yeah. Read it out. Yeah. Have you seen that? Go to chapter 19. The same book. 
Read verse 15. One, two, go. Verse 15, chapter 19. Go on. Read it into 16. Go on. Did you see that? Who is he talking about? Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Where was his sword? In his mouth. His sword was in his mouth. Why should your own be in your hand? His sword was in his mouth. His sword was in his mouth. Now, don't you start figuring Jesus carrying a long sword in his mouth. He says the mouth is the mouth, the front or edge of a weapon. That's what the mouth is. It is the edge of a weapon. So every time you release those cutting words, you are cutting the enemy down. So you say in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the cancer. I curse the cancer. Hey, go ahead and get somebody. When you say this growth will not stay in my body, you are cutting it down. This diabetes will not stay in my body. You are destroying it. You are using your weapon. No wonder he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody say wisdom, 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 wisdom. See, see why you've got to use your mouth, right? You know some people use, they kill themselves, they use the gun, they turn the gun to themselves and shoot, boom, and they die. You know that? In the days they used the swords for fighting, they did the same thing. All right, like, like Saul the king, he said to his soldier, he said, hold that sword and in, 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 I'm going to run into it. And when the soldier wouldn't do it, he killed himself. He used the sword to kill himself. When you talk negatively to yourself, you are using a weapon, a lethal weapon against yourself. No wonder the Bible says, life and death. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That mouse is a dangerous weapon. How can we know this except if wisdom reveals it to us? Wisdom shows it to us. Wisdom. He says, ye are of God, little children. Ye have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know, Jesus said, go in my name. Huh? Oh, hallelujah. You know, you, you're not living in your name anymore. You're not living in your name. I know they call you your name, what, what, what's your name? Huh? What's your name? Dia Sostenis. What's your name? <laughs> That's a wonderful name then. Whose name is what? Call your name. <clears throat> okay, thank you. 
Now, when you read what Jesus said, to go in his name. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Apart from that, you know, he gave us the power of attorney to use his name. Let me tell you why some people, you know, many Christians, they say, but I call the name. Nothing happened. <laughs> yes, I used the name, but nothing happened. What is, what is name? What is name? The word name, what does it mean? Tell me, what, what's, what's the meaning of the word name? <clears throat> huh? Someone says identity. Someone says what? Uh, what? Description. Okay, you've got so many things. So, uh, with your name, you can distinguish between different people. So, your father gave you, you, John. The other one is uh, uh, Christopher. And the other one is Andrew. Because they don't want to call Andrew and Christopher is answering or John is answering to distinguish between them. You see, that's, that's our mentality, right? But in the writing in the scripture there, they didn't mean identification. The word used is onoma, O-N-O-M-A-H, Greek. It means authority. It means character. It doesn't say identity. So when Jesus says for us to go in his name, all right, it means in my authority, in my character. Now when I say in the name of Jesus, I mean authority of Jesus. I mean the character of Jesus. So I'm acting in his character. I'm acting in his authority. Not just in his identity. That's what he's referring to. Now, when you understand that, you begin to notice a difference. That's the power of attorney given to us. In other words, the power to act in his place, to act for him. We represent him. Now, when you use the name with that understanding, you don't need to act any faith. <laughs> Are you still there? It's not a faith thing. Maybe... Faith is evidence. Understand this. Look. <clears throat> Faith is evidence. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He didn't say, you can use my name if you have faith. No. Faith is evidence of the unseen. The name of Jesus has been made available. You don't need to grow faith to use the name of Jesus. I don't know if you're getting this. Okay, let me give you another thing. We have received eternal life. Am I still acting it by faith? No, I have received. It is presently mine. I'm living the life of God now. I'm a new creation now. He didn't say, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation if he has it by faith. No. It's a, understand there's a difference between a promise and a statement of fact. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So, I am a new creation. That is not an act of faith. That is reality. Listen. 
He's, he didn't make a promise. He said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's, a, it's the sovereign declaration of Almighty God. It's a release of information. Do you understand? If you were told that your name just came out for a certain award, something you, maybe a, a degree award, or you, were, you did an examination, and your name came out on the list as among those that have made it, what do you do? You say, I believe by faith. I believe by faith. The guy says, your name is on the list. So you go there and your name is on the list. I believe by faith. I believe by faith. <laughs> that release is an information. It's on the notice board. You don't take it by faith. You know now. Oh. oh. <laughs> Listen, let me explain something to you. Assuming, have you ever, have you ever noticed the footprints of an animal? And you said, hmm, I think. <laughs> I think there's a tiger not far away. So you say, look. See, this, this is definitely from a tiger. And the other guy says, ah, what is this? Evidence. I said, this is what? Evidence. Now, when I say, there's a tiger not far away, it's still very fresh. There's a tiger around. We better get out of here. And while we're thinking, then the bush moves. Then I see Mr. Tiger. Do I still need evidence? No. I don't need any more evidence. This was the evidence. Now Mr. Tiger himself is out there. But Pastor Chris Shirley won't run from any tiger. I was going to show you that. Oh boy. Yeah. No, I'm not going to run for a tiger. Oh, uh, no. That thing that runs away is not inside me. No, I can't run. Oh, no. Mm -mm. Let me tell you a story. Many years ago, I believe it was um, somewhere uh, 1985, I was coming one night from a, a crusade. I had gone to preach. It was about somewhere, maybe 12 midnight. And I decided to take a short court and three large dogs belonging to a certain doctor stopped me. Big dogs, they guarded that place. And they came out, oh, 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 and they ran to me. I stopped and I said, sit down. Now these three dogs were not trained. <laughs> the three dogs sat down. The three of them. And I walked away. Then after several meters, I was like, mine, oh mine. <laughs> Did that really happen? You know, I looked at them again. I said, Lord Jesus, it's true. <laughs> and you know what? Now when I ran, the dogs, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and they ran after me, but I was too far now. <laughs> so you see, I already tested it many years ago, so I know it works. Somebody says, well, that was a dog. You're talking about a tiger. Hey, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Hallelujah. 
Here's the point. That was the evidence, but Mr. Tiger is out there. You can see him. You don't need any evidence now. So when you talk about faith, faith is evidence of unseen realities. But when it's available, you don't need any more evidence. So you have to understand the difference between faith for a promise and when there's a statement of fact made. This is the reality. I am born again. I am not born again by faith. I acted my faith. That's why I received the title of life. Now that I have received what I got by faith, it has come. Don't you understand? When I believed in Jesus and I called his name, that was faith. That was faith. By, by, by faith, I, I trusted and believed. But then he told me, if I made this proclamation, eternal life would be mine. So I acted on what the word said. That was faith, believing that what he said would work. Then when I proclaimed it, believing in my heart, he said, this will be the result. Question, have I done that? Yes. Okay, if you truly believe, have you received? Oh, yes. My faith is what I acted, that I said it, believe in my heart, therefore, this is mine. Okay, is it yours? Yes, it is. If it's true, you no longer have to expect it or believe it. It is done unto you. Now you know you are a new creation. That's why he says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Why? Because love is the first thing that comes into your spirit when you're born again. It says the fruit of the spirit, the recreated human spirit, is love. You see, that's the first one that's manifested in you. And it says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. You see? So now I know. Why? Because I got the love of God in me. See? I know. It says we know that we have passed from death unto life. Then it says the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We're not going to be. We are. He says, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. There is an agreement with my spirit. I know it in my spirit. The Holy Ghost has borne the witness. When there is a witness, it is satisfied. Are you still there? So you're listening to the voice of wisdom. Oh, I told you to look at Ephesians chapter, chapter 1. Let's look at verse 8. Come on, come on, come on, gotta rush this now. I'll close with this. Visions, visions, visions. Do you love visions? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Okay, I like it. Now, from, <clears throat> let's read from verse 18 to verse, no, from verse 6 into verse 8, so we can get it. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accept. Oh boy, did you see that? Wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Say, I'm accepted. Say, I'm accepted. Sombrada hashatika. Li baramando sobradi. Li grohosko prana. Accepted in the blood. Verse 8, verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Did you see that? Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Wherein. Aha. I've got to explain this verse 8 to you. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all Sophia and Phronesis. Did you see that? Oh, shake him, I say. Listen to what he's saying. Th that verse 8 is a little complex when you start in the King James. It says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, what he's saying is this. He says, in which, or which rather, which, he says, his grace, the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. Now, the word in, when you have in all wisdom, 
The word in, in the Greek, is the same for with. All right? So it's a little misleading to say in wisdom. No, he lavished his grace. Shakiba has, has. Lord Jesus, this is powerful. See, he's saying that he lavished his grace on us with, that means together with, all Sophia and Phronesis. He not only gave us his grace, he gave us all wisdom. He gave us all wisdom, all Sophia. In other words, all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom, like the Bible says, glory to God, he got all of that and gave to us, and gave us all the phronesis. Which means everything he gave to Solomon, he gave to us, and much more. He says he lavished his grace on us with all wisdom. With all Sophia and Phronesis, he lavished, lavished. That means superabundance. Do you understand? Now, we, we, we sing grace, grace. We sing a lot of grace. How many people sing in the same way? Wisdom. I got wisdom. Oh, the grace of God. Oh, we thank God is the grace of God. Oh, what about, is the wisdom of God. <laughs> Glory to God. It'll change your steps. I said, it'll change everything about you. When you learn to rejoice. Father, thank you. Oh, did I ever tell you the story about a little girl that was so sick, she was dying? They had to uh, put her in an oxygen tent. They zipped her in there. Okay? Because she had to have oxygen, pure oxygen. The doctor already said she was going to die. Okay? She was going to die. Nine years old. She was going to die. There was no hope for her. And um, uh, she was dying. She couldn't eat any solid food. And uh, somehow the mother being a Christian gave her a little Bible to be reading so she could die lovingly into the arms of Jesus. So she got to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 in her reading. And she read, Who is on self, but as saints on his own body on the tree, that we being dead to saints should live unto righteousness. And she broke down and said, I cried, Lord Jesus, thank you for taking my sins away. Thank you. She cleaned out her eyes and she said, the doctor said, I'm going to die. So Lord Jesus, I'm coming to meet you and I'm coming very soon. Thank you for taking my sins away. She cleaned her eyes and continued the verse. And then she got, by whose stripes you were healed. She thought, did I see that? She looked at it again. Who his own self but our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. The same verse. Huh? By whose stripes you were healed? She said, Lord, I didn't know that. Then she said, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry I wouldn't be coming home very soon. Listen. She said, I'm sorry I wouldn't be coming home very soon. Because I just found out that I've already been here. So she unzipped the thing. She was already going to skin bones. And she carried her skin bones down her legs and put them on the floor. She said, Mama, get my breakfast. Mama come running downstairs. Honey, what's the matter? Oh, she saw her daughter walking out. Honey, come back. Go back to the bed. Oh. <laughs> Carry that. Put her back on the bed. Uh, honey, what do you want? I want to eat my breakfast. You haven't taken solid food for months. She said, Mama, look at it. I've been healed by Jesus. Mama said, oh. The doctor said, the day you die, you're going to lose your mind. Looks like you've already lost your mind. Kept her back in there, ran away to make a phone call to the doctor. Doctor, come quick. My daughter is dying. By the time she came back, the daughter, the daughter had left the bed, gone to the kitchen and started taking breakfast. Honey, what is it? And she was eating her breakfast. The doctor rushed in. What is it? What is it? What is it? She dying. 
put her on the bed, examined her, and found two brand new lungs in her body. Somebody shout hallelujah. somebody it's in the same verse it's in the same verse hallelujah wow uh oh so the same verse that says he gave us grace in superabundance says he gave us all wisdom and prudence and that's all Sophia and Phronesis. Boy, I'm full of wisdom. Hiya. I'm full of wisdom. Hello? Think about it. What will your prayer life be like? When you pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm full of the wisdom of God. I'm full of the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. You're going to work. You say, I'm walking in wisdom today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm walking in wisdom. I'm functioning in wisdom. My faculties are all submitted to wisdom. Wisdom is using my mind. Wisdom is using my brain. Wisdom is using me, walking through me. Glory to God, I'm a success. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. I know who I am. Man, oh my, get up and worship God. Wisdom is mine. Woo! I got wisdom, I got wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. He lavished his grace on us. With all Sophia and Phronesis, he lavished his grace on us. He's made us wise. He's made me wise. He's made me wise. I got wisdom to face any crisis. I got wisdom to face any situation. I got wisdom. I got wisdom in all circumstances. I got wisdom. I know what to do. I'm not confused. I walk in wisdom. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wisdom. 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 You got it all. Sophia. Sonesis and Phronesis. Thanks be unto God. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we honor you, we worship you, we thank you for another beautiful opportunity to have fellowship with you through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. And to have fellowship one with another in your presence. Our hearts and our minds are open to receive your word, to be taught, to be refreshed, to be inspired, to be informed and blessed in your presence. And we receive your word gladly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Did you have a beautiful week? Did you make it beautiful? Did you make it beautiful for anybody else? You sure? You are singing the name of the Lord is a strong tower, right? The righteous runs into it. And it's safe, right? 
It's a beautiful scripture given to us in the book of Psalms, right? But it's not a new creation song. It's a, it's a song for the Jew. Did you know that? You didn't hear me. Did you hear what I said? You're acting like you didn't hear what I said. I said the song you were singing is not for the Christian. It's a song for the old covenant Jew. <laughs> Isn't that obvious? Okay, let me give it to you. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Now, the new creation man does not run into the name of the Lord. He lives by it. The Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave us the power of attorney to live in his name, to function in his name. So we do not run into the name of the Lord. We are born in his name. When you're born again, you're born into Christ. You see that? So the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Right from the hour that you're born again, the name of Jesus is named upon you. From that hour, you live in his name. You function in his name. So you don't have to run into the name of the Lord as a, a strong tower. Hello. Doesn't that make spiritual sense to you? Now that's a fact. That's real. That's the truth. You know, there are lots of things that sound good. They just sound nice. And that doesn't mean they are all right. It's like praying the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You see, you know, I mean, I, I've shown that to you through the scriptures before. It's not right for the man who's born again to pray what is called the Lord's Prayer. In fact, the Lord didn't call it his prayer. You see, what the Bible tells us there is that Jesus taught them a pattern. He said, after this pattern, pray. He didn't say pray this prayer. He said, after this pattern. So he gave them a pattern. But you know, um, commentators and uh, editors of different versions subdividing the... Uh, Bible into topical references chose to call that prayer the Lord's Prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's a pattern. He didn't say pray this prayer. He said pray after this manner. Praise God. Now, when you examine that prayer properly, you would understand why a Christian should not pray that prayer. Praying that prayer is not scriptural, it's not sound, it's not right. But I know that in many Christian homes, when they gather together for a family worship or prayer, somebody says, the Lord's Prayer. Everybody goes, Ah, Father, we heaven, I live in our name, I see heaven, give us this heaven. You know, they just keep praying the same, the same thing. And that prayer, is not supposed to be prayed anymore for several reasons. Now, you want to know more about that? Get the book. What's the title of that book? Praying the Right Way. So get the book. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, that's one of the reasons that... Um, uh, there's a, a teaching ministry in the body of Christ when you have the different ministry gifts he gave some apostles and some prophets 
some teachers, evangelists, pastors, so that God's people can be taught. And except you are well informed in the things of God, you'd be a babe. See? Sometimes people wonder why they do not have the kind of resource that the Bible says they ought to have. But, you know, God said, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. He didn't say for the lack of power. He didn't say for the lack of prayer, you know. He didn't say for lack of any other thing, but he said for the lack of knowledge. They need revelation knowledge, accurate knowledge. And we have dealt with three kinds of knowledge. Make sure you have the tapes. Uh, I think the DVDs should be out soon. Make sure you have them. So you can listen to them again and again and become spiritually stalwart. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, there are many Christians who have problems with demons. You know, they say the devil is at it again. <laughs> I said the devil is at it again. What do you mean the devil is at it again? So they're troubled by the devil, and they shouldn't be troubled by the devil. So they're looking for somebody to pray for them, and that shouldn't be the case. Sometimes they say, I need somebody to pray a powerful prayer for me, because I have a serious problem. You don't need a powerful prayer. You have a powerful God already. Just pray a simple prayer to a powerful God. Huh? That's all that's necessary. Well, are you ready today? Okay. Now, you know, we rounded off our teaching on three kinds of wisdom. Praise God. And um, I'll give you just a few thoughts to think through today. Um, in the light of those teachings. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And sometimes we say, so where do we start? Where do we begin? I haven't learned so much. Where do you start? I'd like us to look at the, one of the scriptures that we emphasized uh, on several occasions during the course of our teaching. Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter one. And I'll be reading to you from verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, now that was the content of his prayer that he talked about, okay? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And we did talk about the spirit of wisdom last week. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, look at verse 18. The eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your spirit, okay? The eyes of your heart being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And, you know, and we read down... Um, to the end of it. But look at that. It says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And we studied that. He said, the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart. Even another version uses the word mind. The eyes of your mind. In other words, he's dealing with your perception. Being enlightened or flooded with light like we studied and found the word was what again fortizo meaning to be flooded with light you know to 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 light up something to illuminate the eyes of your understanding being flooded with light he's talking about light 
in your heart. Because not too many people have light in their hearts. Let's look at something. Would you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4? I'm reading from verse verse 3. Hello. Are you fast this morning? Are you fast? Is your understanding catching quick? You sure? Is it sharp? Very sharp? Okay, let's go. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You see, if our gospel be misunderstood, if our gospel is something that uh, uh, has gone beyond the understanding, if people say, well, we don't know what you're talking about. If it's veiled, he says it's hid to them that are lost. Because it's a simple gospel. Now, let's look at it. If our gospel be, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, notice it says, the God of this world, G-O-D, small G-O-D, the God of this world, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He says, if our gospel be hid, if they do not have light about our gospel, he says, it is only hid to them that are lost. He says, in whom the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Satan. He's the God of this world system. Jesus called him the prince of this world. How did they become the God of this world? Well, he stole that from Adam. That's how he became the God of this world. He's the God of the world system. Praise God. So he says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. People who do not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Satan blinded their minds. You see that? He said, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. He blinded their minds. So that the gospel will not shine into their hearts. Now look at what we just read in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. He, in his prayer, he said, the eyes of your understanding. He said, I pray to God that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your mind, the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light that you may know the hope of his calling. And the word... There where it says that you may know. I, I explained that to you when we were dealing with three kinds of knowledge. The Greek word is idol, meaning to become aware. When, when light is thrown short at your heart, you become aware. You see, you are awakened. It's like when the gospel comes into your heart and you receive it, you are awakened to the fatherhood of God. You just get to know Papa God as your father. You know Jesus as one with you. You see, he's Lord of your life. You believe in that kingdom, even though you do not see it with your optical eyes. You become aware of this real kingdom of God. And some others think you are assuming. You see, they don't know it because their hearts are blinded by Satan. But there's more to be known. And that's the reason Paul's praying this for the Christians in Ephesus. You see, he says, I pray to God that your spirit will be flooded with light. That you may become aware of the hope and the riches of his inheritance. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, now, how, what does God do for that prayer to be answered? What does he do? How is that prayer answered? He says, I pray to God that your, that your spirit, your heart, or some versions say, your mind will be flooded with light. So you become aware. And I said, mark the word there, that you may know. I said, the word is idle, to become aware. It's a knowledge of awareness. 
Turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. <coughs> Have you found it? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory, glory, glory. I love the Word of God. Do you? Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. He says the entrance, verse 130. Have you seen it? The entrance of thy words, I want you all to read it. Read it for me. This is powerful. He says, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Now, he's not, you, you know, I, I told you sometimes you have to um, um, look at what exactly he's dealing with. Like one time, you know, a few, maybe I believe two years ago, something like that, we were looking at Rema. Do you remember? And we, we studied the difference between Rema and Logos. Now, when you read it from the, from the Old Testament English version like this, you don't get it. Okay? And there's such a big difference between Rema and Logos. Logos is the word of God, is the, is the totality of his revelation. Okay? It is the word of God. Concerning God or from God, anything, that's the word of God. That's the logos of God. But rhema is the active word. It is the spoken word. And it is the now word. Okay? Now, in this place, he says, the entrance of thy logos. That's from the Greek translation of that verse. Okay? He says, the entrance of thy logos give it light. Now, interestingly, it doesn't just say give it light. Like you see it there. It is exactly the same kind of thing we have in verse 18 in chapter 1, the book of Ephesians, where it says, flooded with light. He uses the same word for tizo. Okay? The entrance of thy logos floods your heart with light. The Greek word is for tizo. Illuminates. The entrance of your word, which means, and you know, when you're studying the Bible, when you're studying the word of God, this is the logos of God. That's not Rhema. That's logos. So when you study and the word of God gets into you, he says what? Your heart to be flooded. That's for Tizo. And that's what Paul was praying. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. He says that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your spirit, will be flooded with light. Now David had that revelation here. He says the entrance of your word, the entrance of your word, the entrance of your logos, gives light, gives illumination. So my heart is illuminated. My spirit is illuminated. The light is turned on in my spirit when the word of God gets into my heart. So when I'm studying on my own, oh, the entrance of thy word give it light. Then it says, it gives sunemai. That's talking about sunesis, understanding, comprehension. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's powerful. We're talking about, that's the second, the second kind of wisdom, right? It brings sunesis. To who? 
to the simple. Now, what do you mean simple there? The word simple, hello? Are you here? You catching something? Now, this is very important because it helps us see how we journey from a certain level in our lives to a higher level and what our roles are as individuals. You have a role to play. You can determine what happens to you. You can determine how your life is going to be in the next four months, in the next six months. You can determine your progress. You can choose to be successful and never to be a failure. And this is all in the Word of God. He makes us participate. Hallelujah. We get involved. So we're no longer in the dark as to what our lives will turn out to be. Oh, you know, there are people who say, um, we never know what's going to happen. Maybe I might be successful. Maybe I might be, uh, I might fail. I don't know. I just pray that I'll be successful. No, it's not so anymore. It's not so anymore. It's only ignorance that keeps men in failure. Success is your birthright. If you're born again. Prosperity is your birthright. If you're born again, it's your birthright. You can choose to be poor. It's a choice. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to fail. You can make a choice to fail. And you can make a choice to be successful. Failure is no longer an accident. It doesn't just happen. The only reason it happens to a child of God is if he's ignorant. So he said, my people perish. He said, they are crushed. My people are crushed. They are destroyed. They are put under because of the lack of knowledge. What knowledge? Revelation knowledge. Hallelujah. Now look at this. It says, the entrance of thy words give it light. It illuminates the heart. Okay? Then it says, it brings synesis. What is that? Comprehension. We talked about that. He said it's a mental putting together. The ability to synthesize information and produce something out of it. Thanks be unto God. You can now use all the information that you have. You are no longer a failure. Glory to God. You can act on information and use it for your benefit. He says it giveth understanding. Sunesis. He says, soon am I. And that's what we found when I explained it to you in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Okay? Do you remember that? To have good success. That's what he called it. He used the word, soon am I. To have good success. Now, when it says, it gives understanding. If we were to look at it in the same way that they render that verse in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, in the Hebrew, from where it was translated into English, then we might as well look at it this way. The entrance of thy words, give it light. It floods your heart with light. It makes the simple successful. Actually, it will mean he brings him into success. There's a reason for that. Why? Because the one he calls simple, the Greek used the word. He used the word nepios. Nepios means a babe. I want you to put that down because of its importance. I, I will explain it to you. Nepios means a babe. So when you see in the, in the King James translation, he got, he used the word simple. Now, the two words translated babe that you'd find in the New Testament, or it's translated from the Greek, okay? The New, the New Testament you have. These two words are, one, nepios. You get it? 
Then the other one is Bifros. Now you go to First Peter. Let me locate them for you. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. The P is N E P I O S, okay? And refers is B R E P H O S. Did you get it? Okay. Now, in First Peter chapter two, verse two. I'll show you two, two scriptures here that will help you distinguish between them. Because both of them in the English have the same translation, babe. Okay? All right. First Peter chapter 2, in verse 2, it says, As newborn babes, as newborn babes, as newborn briefers, okay, babes briefers, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. As newborn babes, he says, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. As newborn babes, briefers, he says, desire the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. What does that give us? He's telling us a babe, an infant. Okay? He says, as newborn babes, these babes always ask, they always cry for the milk. You understand? So he says, as newborn babes, we should desire. Now, he's not saying that we are newborn babes. The Greek word for us is the same as like. Okay? So he's saying like newborn babes. Like newborn babes. Like newborn briefers. Desire the sincere milk of the word. He says act like newborn babes. Act like briefers. Act like them. How? He says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Desire it that you may grow thereby. But there's more. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. The sincere milk of the word of God. Hallelujah. That you may grow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 5. And I'm reading to you from verse 13. Are you there? He says, for everyone that useth milk, have you seen it? Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. This time he uses the word nepios. He says, everyone that useth milk is unskillful. In the word of righteousness. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful. Now he says, like newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Now he says, everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now this time he says, Nepios. What's the difference between Brefors and Nepios. Both mean babe. Both refer to infants. Okay. Now you put this down. It's important. Refers, refers to infants with respect to their physical condition. It refers to infants with respect to their physical condition. So he's talking about a physical babe. So he says, as newborn babes, or like newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So 
Bridford refers infants with regards to the physical condition, that they are physical babes. Now, Napios, on the other hand, refers to infants with respect to their mental and spiritual condition. The mental and spiritual condition. Literally, it means one that cannot talk right. He's such a babe, his, his mental faculties are not developed enough for him to talk right. His spiritual faculties are not developed enough for him to talk right. He does not have the necessary comprehension or power of mind to reason and therefore act maturely. So he deals with his immaturity, mental and spiritual immaturity. That's why he uses the word nepios. So he says everyone that uses milk, uses milk. Now the first one says desire the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. He's talking about consuming it. Okay? But then he says everyone who uses milk is unskillful. So now he's not just talking about only feeding on milk. He says who is acting on milk. You see, when you eat, you work. On the basis of the kind, the quality of food that you eat, you are strong enough to act, to function, to work. But now he says, if you are feeding on milk, you cannot act that way. You cannot act according to the word of righteousness. He says, because you are an appeals, which means milk is not enough to help you grow mentally and spiritually to the point of using, being skillful in the word of righteousness. Now that's very important when he says being skillful in the word of righteousness is dealing with a fight. Are you still there? Being skillful, skillful, skillful in the word, oh boy, do I like this. Skillful in the word of righteousness. The word of righteousness. Being skillful in the word of righteousness. He says that fellow is an appeals. He cannot, he's not skillful in the word of righteousness. He can't talk right. The word of righteousness. He's unskillful in the word of righteousness. We're talking about something on, on Wednesday night, if you remember. I explained something, something to you in the New Testament where he translates a special word for mouth. Okay? The word from where mouth was translated from the Greek version into English is the word stoma. Okay? And what does that mean? He said, the front or edge of a weapon. Which means your mouth is the front or the edge of a weapon. <laughs> Come on now. Now, in fact, literally, the Greek said, straight the edge of a sword. And I showed you in the New Testament, from several portions of the Bible, how that Jesus Christ was said to have a sword in his mouth. Now that doesn't mean that every time you see Jesus, there's a sword protruding from his mouth. No! He's explaining something to you that's so powerful. He said with the sword of his mouth, he will rule the nations. Your mouth is the edge of a weapon. So when it says, take unto you the whole armor of God, and then it says the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, all of that, then it tells you, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It says, which is the rhema of God, which is the spoken word. 
Meaning when you speak, you are cutting things down. Oh, hallelujah. Hey! He said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema of God. And that's a spoken word. It's coming out of your mouth. And your mouth is what? The edge of a weapon. It's the edge of a weapon. So when you're attacked by sickness, cut it down. Cut it down. Talk to it. Jesus said, talk to the mountain. Cut it down. Cut it down. Use your mouth. That's where the sword is. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The entrance of thy word, give it light. It floods your heart with light. Every time you take the Bible and you're studying with the presence of the Holy Spirit teaching you, you are flooding your spirits with light. Light's coming in. And when light comes in, he says, he also gives what? Sunesis. He brings sunemai. Meaning what? He brings you into success. Not just success, but good success. Hallelujah. See what the word of God will do in your life. It will bring you into a place of success. It doesn't matter what you do. He says it will help the simple. It will bring the simple. It gives understanding unto the napios, to the babes who are unable to talk. He gives them ability to comprehend, ability to analyze and synthesize. And then until what happens, they become creators. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I said he's made us masters. We're not beggars trying to find our way. Ye are the light of the world. Can you shout amen, somebody? Now, you just think about it. Look at it. Jesus came to this world to die. Don't you understand? He came from God to die. He came to die. It was so important he came to die. If he only came to save us from our sins, he would have taken us to heaven immediately. But that was not the reason. He came to give us life. He said, I am come. Not to save them from sins alone. No. In fact, I want you to understand this. The issue of sin needs to be clearly understood. He didn't come to give us forgiveness. Okay? When he saved us from our sins, it was for a purpose. That was a means to an end. So he, his end result was not to save us from sin. The reason for saving us from sin was so that we will have the right to become the sons of God. You didn't get that. Did you get that? He came to save us from sin so that he will separate us unto himself. We are bought with the price. Don't you understand? So we belong to him. And now that he has saved us from sin, he filled us with the life of God. He had the right to give us eternal life because we were saved from sin. We were purified and declared not guilty. So he brought us in, filled us with eternal life. Now he has made us sons of God. That's what the Bible says. Now are we the sons of God. Now. He doesn't say when we get to heaven. He says now are we the sons of God. Then he says but it does not yet appear. Outwardly. It does not yet appear. What we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Can you shout amen somebody. But now are we the sons of God. We are living that life now. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 verse 17, as he is, so are we in this world. Oh, come on somebody. What a life. Every day talk to yourself. Do you understand? Say I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I know who I am. And the more you declare that, the stronger you become. The stronger you become. And everything that tried to oppress you will go down because you have been made a victor in Christ Jesus. 
Oh, hallelujah. You see, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And how does that joy come? That joy comes, see, joy and happiness are two different things. Happiness is uh, something of the emotions. Okay? We feel like we're happy, so we act it. It's in our senses. Happiness. Do you understand? It's a feeling. But joy is deep in your spirit. Are you hearing me? How can a man be joyful when everything is going wrong? Is it possible? Emphatically, yes. The man may not be happy, but he can be joyful. And joy is greater than happiness. Are you hearing this? Now, joy is in your spirit. No matter what you're going through. And so you can stay up what you got on the inside. And you better do it because it's so important. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So you get weak when you feel sad and you're acting according to happiness or unhappiness. When you're not happy, nobody around you can be happy because everything's gone bad and sour. So what? Well, you know, how's everything? Well, it's, it's bad, bad, bad. You know, you're unhappy, looking sad. You know what? You cannot win. In the crisis that you're in, you cannot win. But if you want to win, you've got to stay joy from the inside. How can you stay joy? It's no matter, oh God, please make me joyful. Oh God, I want to be happy. Uh -uh. You start by, Lord, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I've got the Holy Ghost. I've got the life of God in me. Now, when you start talking like that, you're staring your spirit. You're staring your spirit because inside there's joy. Hallelujah. You see, you can talk in tongues and be crying. You can talk in tongues and not be happy. You can talk in tongues and still not be joyful. Why are you talking in tongues and feeling so bad? Why? Because when you talk in tongues, it's your spirit that's praying. Your understanding is unfruitful. So talk in tongues, all right. But if you want to come well up that thing, the joy of your spirit to fill your mind so that you can act like you're joyful, you've got to bring it to your understanding. So you start speaking. It's called prophetic praying. Are you hearing me? You start taking the word of God. He says, take with you words. And then you start uttering them. I know who I am. As he is, so am I. I cannot fail. I'm a victor in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Worship him and thank him. Worship him. We're out of time. Worship him.